How many of you agree that they are nothing? Absolutely nothing without the Lord. You could do better than that. Before um, I minister, I want you to take some time and I want you to pray. You pray. I want you to go before the Lord and I want you to pray down a few strongholds that I want to name. I want you to Everybody to participate that's a believer. I want us to continue to be a community of prayer. Apathy. Go before the Lord right now. Pray against apathy among God's people. Pray for the person that thinks they have to do life on their own. Pray for them. Pray that God would break the chain of worldliness in his people. I want you to grab hands with one person next to you at least. Whether you know them or not, y'all pray for each other. Just start praying for that person. If something comes to mind, just pray it for them. It might be the Lord speaking to you on behalf of that person. Father God, that's our prayer. We want you to breathe through us. And God, I pray that you would blow your breath on this congregation. Send oil that your power will move and you would interrupt our gatherings. Interrupt. God, may you never be an interruption to us. And God, I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts to see you more clearly as a community. Touch the individual that's here on their last leg. Will you hold them up? Will you give them strength? In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody agree with that said? Amen. 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 Um, I don't know why y'all sitting down. I don't know why y'all sitting down. <laughs> if you came with one of our covenant community members just to support them today for, for right hand of fellowship would you raise your hand we just want to acknowledge you as well thank y'all for being with us today not if you're a member I'm talking about if you came from somewhere else I see members going like this I ain't talking to you I'm talking about the visitors who came to yeah amen 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 all right all right Let's go. I'm, um, as we get forward, we, we're trusting God. I want to, um, my prayer is that th as we move in, not, I'm not even talking about the series right now. <clears throat> this is just quick pastoral reflection. I'm praying that God would um, expand our territory in this community. 
And one of the reasons, I mean, I, you know, we talk about the community development stuff. That's all great. I want to talk about Sunday mornings. Um, I would love it if for a, a stint of time we did one service. And the reason being is not merely f for my convenience or anything else. Um, and we do want to <clears throat> bless our volunteers and for them not to be here these Sundays on, uh, for three services. But really, I, I'm sensing a threshold and I need for the spirit to move during our gatherings. And I'm not talking about us being here four hours either. I know some of y'all like, let's stay at three services. <laughs> you know, let's stay at the number. We're not talking about that. But what we are talking about, I, I feel like there's some things that God wants to do. Uh, in our midst, um, where we need to minister to one another as a congregation, praying, a healing, breakthroughs, um, words of knowledge, different things that I think that are very, very important for the health of a body. And I know you can't stuff everything into a gathering, but as we come to, come to mind, uh, as the church comes to mind, I, I believe us moving has been spiritual warfare. Um, and, um, and so I want you, or matter of fact, why don't you just take that before the Lord right now? That there were any barriers that's in the way of us, our territories being extended, God, that God will break. I want you to go before the Lord real quick. We're going to give you a minute. Go ahead. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. One, two, three, read. Amen. We're starting a new series today. Manhood. 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 That's it. Let's go before the Lord. <laughs> Lord, I need your power. I need oil. I need that gate from heaven that makes stuff happen. And God, will you shower for the sake of your children? Will you send rain, fresh rain, into this place, Lord God, that we would never be the same? None of us. Lord God, although I'm preaching to men, women are listening. Nurture their hearts, strengthen the men, and increase our male quotient, manhood quotient in this church. We're excited about what you're going to do in encouraging us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, God, our strength and our redeemer in whom we trust. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody agree with that said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, it's interesting in, in our world, I know that there has been an imbalance in how men <coughs> have treated women. Historically, um, bad patriarchy has affected how women view men. And so in light of those imbalances and some of those legitimate frustrations of men uh, standing on the neck of women in different ways, there has been culturally some things that the culture has been trying to put in place to deal with those imbalances. Um, and there's nothing wrong with having some checks and balances uh, for um, those who we would see, whether it's you calling it authority or leaders, whatever. But I, I do think this, I, I do think this, we're, we're about to start taking it too far. Um, because, because we are, we, we are spading men um, of their ability to be men. 
And, and, and what's beginning to happen is men are so confused now more than ever on how do I be a man because you don't know if how you're being a man offends uh, the status quo of culture. Now, what I'm talking about is I'm not talking about taking, taking advantage of women or anything like that, but what I am talking about is this, is this world is taking it too far in the way they're trying to upgrade the female presence at the, ex at the, at the challenge of clear manhood. We need clear manhood. Now, when we say this, we're not talking about ogreisms and being a macho. We're talking about biblical, because it's funny, as soon as there's a manhood absence and everybody started yelling, we need more men. And, uh, I, you know, it's an it's a, um, a, a article that came out last week talking about Philadelphia um, and, and, and the manhood and womanhood population and how there's a deficit in men in the city, and, 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 and particularly among the black male population. And um, that's why we unapologetically are about get, engaging men. And so at this church, engaging men isn't our disposition where we're going to stop engaging women. No, that's not our desire in any way, shape, or form. Um, we have a full-time person that ministers to men, and we have a full-time person that ministers to women. So you see that we have equal development and commitment to both sides of the equation, and yet we feel a strong pull and passion to begin to develop um, what it means and what the need for in our world and in this culture for men. I love what Proverbs says. Proverbs 20, verse 6 says, Many a person proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy man? Who can find a trustworthy man? And well, 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 if, if anybody should find a trustworthy man, it should be us in the church. Somewhere over the landscape as we look out, there should be a trustworthy man out there so well. And I believe that I've seen the stock in this church. I believe that I've seen godly men in this church. And I'm, and I, and I'm believing that God is going to increase that quotient and make it even more potent. The text at hand, um, interestingly enough, as we get ready to get into it, as I looked at this, and I'd never seen this before, everything that man yearns for, and even woman, to get answered about the deeper questions of life is dope. God in these verses pre-answers this question before he creates us. He, he answers the question, and we're going to see that in how God made us, and particularly this is Zoom lens at men, the question of who am I, what's my value, and what's my purpose are inferentially answered in this text even before man was created. And so God put in you the questions that we ask as fallen people are answers that are only found in the living God. And because they're only found in the living God, one of the beautiful things that we see in God's work in our lives is through Christ he already placed those things in us. I like what our brother said in the, man, the masculine mandate when it comes to manhood. He says, it's a nice kind of quasi-definition of manhood. He says, to be spiritual men placed in a real world. Let's stop right there. I love this here as he talks about stuff in a real world because men, we are visual and we are fantasy oriented. And because we are visual and fantasy oriented, it is extremely easy for us uh, to create a world versus living in a real world. But, but real men don't live in the fantasy world. We live in the real world where we have to practice practical realities. But not only does he say uh, the spiritual men are placed in a real world, next thing he says, interestingly enough, is God defined relationships. I like that. Because every relationship we have must have a God designation to it. Okay, let me see if I can make it plain as we get ready to get in the text. Can I just intro this real quick? Um, 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 everything in your life should have a gold on it. The Bible says, he who does not have vision is unrestrained. And so that means in every relationship, you, you understand. Now, this is not a series on dating, but I am going to bring it up. It's like being in a relationship with somebody and just saying you're getting to know them, and it's still been five years. Or, we talking. What's that? I never knew what that meant. <laughs> y'all kissing, hugging, and dating, but talking. Y'all doing more than that. 
right? <laughs> and so one of the things that real men do, and we're going to come back to this later in the series, is we define relationships very quickly. In other words, real men don't let a woman emotionally meander in wondering what is the nature of a relationship. See, men of vision say, hey, how you doing, sis? Um, you know, we've been in community together. I know we've been in the same life group. And, um, you know, some people were saying, man, you should, you, should, you should see how she's doing and maybe go out and could we go out and go get some coffee sometime at the Locker Loam in Fishtown? That's, the, that's their flagship location. Um, and they have French cuisine there, a little bit of French cuisine. So you and I can sit there. We can have another couple come, accountability, whatever. But why would we need accountability if this is just something? Well, I, I'm very, very, very interested in you. And, um, and, 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 and one of the things, I just want to let you know, sweetheart. Um, one of the things I want you to know is, is, is since God is a God of order, I want to be a man of order. And because I'm a man of order, and I care about your emotions, as well as your spirit, we're going to put the necessary mechanisms in place to be able to, I'm not saying I'm marrying you today, but my goal, my goal of approaching you is to see if it would be the will of God for us to one day get married. Will you be open to going out with me? And also, I heard your father is in North Carolina. Okay, well, before I go out with you, I do need to, I want to talk to him just to let him know what I'm up to because before I become your covering, he's your covering. So when we, when we talk about being a man in God-defined relationships, sisters, come back, sisters. Y'all, sisters. <laughs> Folks sweating, come on. Come on back. <laughs> to be spirit, <laughs> spiritual men <laughs> placed in real world God defined relationships as lords and servants under God to bear God's fruit by serving and leading I love that and so I, I want us to bear down in four things that I think would help us um, uh, as, as men to be framed well and give you kind of an overview vision of who you are generally and what you're called to do generally and trust that the Spirit of God will fill in the blanks practically. Point one, <laughs> restoration of identity. Restoration of identity. He says, then God said in verse 26, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, they will rule over or rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, oh Lord, and the creatures they crawl on earth. Man and woman were meant to image God together. I'll explain what imaging means, but they were supposed to be equal vice regents. But you will see in a minute, because of the order of creation, he wanted man, even prior to the fall, the man didn't become leader in the fall. Man was leader prior to the fall. And God's mandate was first given to him, thereby, since the mandate was given first to him, it was, although God repeated it to both of them, he was supposed to hold the mantle of making sure that the mandate went forth. And they were supposed to rule the earth together. In real time, they were supposed to be a real king and queen. And so, so they were supposed to be rulers on the planet and create other rulers who ruled the planet with them. Stop there. 
Do you recognize that we were created to rule? We'll see this in a second. But, 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 but as we think about that, think about the bigness of what God had planned for you. And if he created you to rule, think of what he put inside of you. And so, men, if, if he created you to rule, we're going to come back to this at the end, but, but, but if he created you to rule, what did he put inside of you? We'll see that in a second. But he said, God, he, he emphasizes this several times. Three times he talks about the image of God. And the reason why this is important is because God makes it important. What does it mean to image God? I want to continue to repeat this over and over and over again until we recognize what God is saying to us. When it talks about imaging God, God has what we call incommunicable attributes and communicable attributes. His incommunicable attributes are those things that are those big picture things like eternal in nature, meaning he's infinity. The Bible says, I'm about to say infinity beyond. Um, that's how you know I got kids. I'm about to say it again. I did the same thing at the first service. <laughs> I'm about to say infinity and beyond. That thing, if they turn, push that button one more time, I was going to scream. Um, but God is infinite. He's infinite. So no, no other being is infinite. So that's in, he can't commune with you in a way that you share in his nature in that way because only that would make you him. That's what makes it incommunicable. Not only that, he, he, he doesn't change. How many of you glad he don't change? How many glad he don't change? In his, in his nature, in his nature, he doesn't change. Not only that, he's omnipresent. He's omniscient and he's omnipotent. Now, I know some of y'all think y'all are some of these things. <laughs> you think you're eternal. You think you're unchangeable and you changed since last week. <laughs> but these aren't the things that we are. What, what makes us us? That God has given us imaging power in, and I'm particularly pointing to men here, we are given the capacity to love. Mm, don't you that make you feel warm? Knowledgeable, merciful, and just. So if these are things that are supposed to, we're supposed to be, we are supposed to image these things as God's communicable attributes and a reflection of him. <laughs> what does this have to do with anything? Well, somebody can say a fallen person can be those things. Well, let's give you another lesson on that. When the fall happened, they didn't lose the image of God. They lose, they lost God. So when you lose God, but still have his stuff, you don't use it the way he wants you to. So that's why ungodly people can show signs of love, compassion, and mercy and grace because God didn't take those attributes away from them. He left them there, but he left them. Now, what happens in the gospel, though, is that Jesus comes into our life and restores the damage of the image. What does that mean? Is that we as believers should be the best erry thing. We should be the best thinkers. We should be the best creators. Men, you should be the best single dudes. You shouldn't be no grimy dude up on no demonic foolishness on multipl multiplified smashology all over the place. You're the, you're, you were built to be the best single man. You were, you were built to be, have the best self-control. You were built to, to be the best honorer of women. You were built to be the best lover. You, that's, that's, that, if, if, if a woman is looking for love, she, the best lover on the planet is a Christian man. <laughs> now, somebody going to say, well, I had bad experiences. Don't equate your experiences in God-ordained identity. Because God, he's living less than his identity if he's loving you less than God anointed him to. And so when we look at the way God has made us, we're supposed to be the best husbands. Who should look at us and, I mean, I mean, we should be a nasty portfolio of beastly men. We should be the best fathers. We should be the best everything. 
because we've been redeemed by the multifaceted power of the Lord Jesus Christ and brought into a powerful eternal relationship with him. And so when it talks about us imaging and reflecting and honoring the image of God, we as God's people should be the best of the image bearers. Number two, not only restored identity, but the restored capacity. Restored capacity. This is beautiful. It says here, God blessed them. Stop right there. Um, first he made them in the image, but then he blessed them. Now this is very, very important because blessed is a big word in the Bible. Blessed isn't a small word in the Bible. Blessed means here to endow with capacity and potential. In other words, when God created you, he doesn't tell you anything to do that he doesn't put inside you. That, that, mean, that means you have the, whatever God calls you to do, man of God, that's what I'm going to call you. I'm not going to call you out of your name. Man of God, you were built with brand spanking new capacity and potential. The thing you have to be careful of is living potential only. Okay. Okay. Living potential only means that you make yourself potential and not practical because practical is harder, potential is an image. So it's easy for everybody to always say you're a particular way. That's why many men remain single for a long time. Because many men like to be a potential. Because p potential has a lot of verbal approbation. You got merciful. He's such a good man. He's such a dope dude. He's such a better vibe. When you get married, then you, the real you get seen. Then... We got to see how that potential get worked out. <laughs> and so in light of that reality, God doesn't want us meandering in what we could be. He wants us to walk in who he's called us to be. And so in light of that reality, it, it, it just it, it interestingly reminds me of what it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It said, he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. What does that mean? That God has downloaded onto your hard drive, man, everything that you are to be as a man. That means you're not going anywhere else looking for it because it's a lot of opportunities to look for, even if your father wasn't there for you. Christ has given you enough capacity to override even what you didn't get with your pops. Like, in other words, God didn't make you with a crutch. God made you through Christ the best and fully you. I, I have, I have a, I have a um, program. Um, this reminds me of a program, a software I use. It has like 5,000 books on it that I use for um, sermon prep and different just Bible study and personal study called Lagos. It has all of these different things on it. It's just, it just can do all these things. So when I've, I've been using it for 20 years. So when they turned over, I was using it the old way. And so I was getting my little stuff done. And I was enjoying what I was getting done, but, but, but I, I didn't know what I had in my possession. So I ended up going to a Lagos camp. When I went to the Lagos camp, dude was doing all kinds of stuff. Dude was taking one word, a chart comes out of it, and then all of a sudden it sprouts all of the different cousin words of it, shows you what verses that they're in, how they're used in different contexts. Not only that, it can help you build your sermon out and develop a PowerPoint automatically. I was like, dang. But what I realized is I was using it based on the old formula, not the new formula. And, and, and I didn't realize what had been placed in my possession had more potential than the way that I was using it. Listen, manhood is in your possession, but many of us are using it the old way. We're not using it the new way. And God is trying to tell you, man, that I have more for you and in you, listen, through Christ, than what you're permanent, what you're, what you're uh, 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 proposing and purposing right now because God wants you to mine and maximize the manhood that he's given you. And that means you have to get around places where that manhood is developed and nurtured. You, you have to get around those places where God's means of grace are going forth. 
Because God doesn't, again, just want us to live in potential. He wants us to live in practice. But many times we take a, a downgraded version of ourselves when we could work in God's work and be a better version of ourselves. Let me see if I can make it plain again. Kobe and Shaq. <clears throat> Kobe, you know, is, is an animal on the court, you know. But, he, but he's an animal on the court because of the way his workout ethic was. Because of his workout ethic, um, he would get on his teammates' nerves. And one of the people's nerves he would get on was Shaq's. Because Shaq loved eating Big Macs and Quarter Pounders. A lot. And because he's so big, he could just hold the ball over the basket and just drop it in. <laughs> but, 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 but when he would get to the free throw line, I never seen anybody hold the, the ball with their fingertips and he'd push it in and he'd end up missing. And, 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 so, and, so, and so what ended up happening is Kobe started getting mad at him because Kobe was like, man, listen, get in this gym with me. Let's work out. Let's stop going to McDonald's. Let's get a nutritionist. Let's work. But Shaq got frustrated. And so Shaq wasn't feeling him. He stopped feeling him. Ended up going, we don't know why they left. That's, we'll leave that in cyberspace. But <laughs> all I know is when he got to the heat and it was time for them to play the Lakers, Shaq, Shaq wasn't belly Shaq. Shaq came out replicated. You know, he came out, he came out, he was like, wow, Shaq, because he knew that he didn't have the person on his team to take up the slack for what he wasn't doing anymore. And therefore, he had to get his weight up in order to do what he had to do to maximize his potential. What does God have to take out of your life? What, do, what, do, what, what in your life are you leaning on? That, 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 that God has to remove out of your life uh, be, because it's, it, it, you, you're leaning on it and you're not maximizing the potential that God has placed you in. It's like when I was working out. You know, I was working out one day and I was using those, I forgot them rope things that you pull down like this. You know, I forgot, yeah, the, the, the triceptical exercise, you know. <laughs> and so, um, so I started pulling them down and I'm doing like this and I'm going like that. And now nah, the trainer's like, nah, man. So he came up beside me. He held my elbows back. I was like, what you doing? <laughs> and then he said, you're working out, but you're not getting everything out of these pulls that you could have. And then he says, now pull, and when you get to the bottom, jerk it down like that. And then all of a sudden, my triceplication started <laughs> turning on fire. <laughs> Why? Because I had to be put in a position to work harder and be restricted in order that I can maximize my workout. That's the same thing God wants to do in the muscles of your masculinity. He wants to train you and hold you in some places still for a minute so you can work the spiritual muscles that he's called you to work. Not only that, <coughs> um, next is restoration of productivity. He wants to restore your productivity. It says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Fruitfulness here is really the product of your potential. That's really all he's saying is that now that you are working through your potential, God is blessing you in order to be fruitful. Here in the context is for them to multiply, create more human beings, fill the earth with glory reflectors or image bearers who rule the earth and subdue it and, 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 and really work to what we'll talk about at some point about turning chaos to cosmos. In other words, turning the mess of the world, of the undeveloped parts of the world, into organized developed parts. That's what we're supposed to do in our fruitfulness. And men were built for fruitfulness. And in being, being built for fruitfulness, the only way to maximize fruitfulness is to finish stuff. You got to finish stuff. Got to finish stuff. You won't see. Many of us want results without putting our hand to the plow. And one of the things I'm on my sons all the time, finish. If you take out the trash, go to all the trash cans. If you put the clothes in the wash, put all the clothes in the wash. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I know they're like, Dad, what does this have to do with life? I wonder. And I'm saying, I tell my sons all the time, every minor incomplete can equal a big incomplete later. I know so many grown men with patterns of incompletes that if you trace the incompletes back, it goes back to a, a lifestyle of not completing stuff. 
But what God wants us to do is to be able to complete stuff because you can't be fruitful until you stay somewhere, until you remain faithful, and you see it from beginning to end. Um, Jesus is like that. Listen, Jesus was, has spent a life of completing. He was born. It was fulfilled. <laughs> Somebody say he had nothing to do with it. Yes, he did. He decided to jump in her womb. Fulfilled. He got baptized even though he didn't need to. John was like, I ain't baptizing you. He says, no, it's good to, the same word, fulfill, complete all forms of righteousness. He likes completing stuff. When he healed and when he preached, he says, this was written in order that what he was saying may be fulfilled or complete. When he suffered on the cross, he said, to tell us that it is finished. Jesus Begin stuff, and Jesus complete stuff. We are called as men to be beastly completers of everything in our life. Last thing, and I'm out your way. The restoration of drive. The restoration of drive. Look at the next part of the verse. It said, God bless him, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it and rule. Subdue, subdue. It's a beautiful word. It means to bring under one's control for God's benefit. To bring under God's control, uh, uh, bring under your control for God's benefit. What is drive? Having the tenacity to get something done. I can't. I, I, I don't. I don't have. Listen. I. It's hard for me to be in relationship with a drivenless man. Listen, because in your life you don't want to be in a place where if you choose to be in a, a marital relationship where your wife always got to get you up. Take us to church. Lead, pray for me, let's walk, do this, do that, all the time. Now, that's going to happen sometime in marriage, but it can't happen all the time. Listen, drivenness is the reflection of your character that God created you as a man to lead. What is a leader? The willingness to take the initiative for the benefit of others. That's your call, man. That's your call, man. That means you, uh, you, know, you can't wait on a job to come to you. You got to go get it. You, got, you can't watch YouTube to learn how to start a business. You got to go read some books. See, a driven man knows that there's not a microwave process to getting things done. A, a, a man knows it's going to take me some time, but I'm going to get my grind on and I'm going to get this and I'm going to master it. Listen, let me tell you as a man, I, 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 am, I am not, listen, I, I'm not the preacher I want to be. I still am, I got like five books I'm working on right now for me personally to grow in my preaching. And I'm trying to figure out, I need to work on this part, I need to work on that part. As a leader, I'm trying to figure it out. We have to be driven in every area. When God gives you those clear core competencies that he's called you to, now you gotta begin nurturing those core competencies and being driven to work on those particular things. I'm not the writer that I wanna be. See, even the preacher, he's, he's inside of me and I hear him. And he's preaching, but I'm, I'm working every week to get him out of me. <laughs> Same thing with fathering. Everything in your life that God has put before you, and you got a lot of great stuff before you, man. You got a lot of great stuff before you, man of God, and you have to begin saying, I'm going to take the initiative to begin working out what does it mean to become a better man in my life. Why? Because Christ died so that you can be self-driven and the Spirit leads you into all truth. That's the beauty of that. And why is that important with all that we said? He said, subdue and rule. Everything in our life and in this world is in the cycle of redemption. Everything. And what God has called men to do is go out in the world and in their own lives to go into places that are undeveloped and chaotic and be driven for them to be brought under God's rule by him expressing his manhood in very, very powerful and practical ways. Check out this video that reflects that. Detroit's vacant lots are getting a makeover, and what they're being transformed into is making a difference in the community. Coco McAvoy shows you how the group behind it is hoping the work will have a lasting impact. In this quiet Midtown neighborhood on 14th Street, 
That's yeah. hell. There's a clear sign of growth. We're kind of embedding ourselves into the community here. Eric Andrews grew up in the neighborhood. Over the years, some of the land has been deserted. It was pretty much abandoned, tires, it was, it was not used at all. Andrews had a vision for what the neighborhood could be. We brainstormed what to do about the land. What better than to do than to farm it? The idea for Peace Tree Parks then came to fruition. Peace Tree Parks is a, is a nonprofit organization started right here in Detroit with the goal to just encourage citizens to eat healthier. This um, once vacant patch of land was transformed into a community garden. We grow fruit. We grow, we have two apple trees, a nectarine tree, a peach tree. Watermelon, cantaloupe, and all kinds of vegetables are also harvested. Kale, cabbage, and broccoli are the main things we've grown as our cool weather crops. Andrews and his team expanded their reach to more people, building dozens of backyard gardens in the city of Detroit. That is our ultimate goal, is to have a garden in the backyard of every household in Detroit. Uh, because at that point, the, uh, we feel like that household has been educated to the benefits of growing their own food. He has a big team behind him, including his family, friends, and volunteers, all taking on a hefty load to maintain the gardens. Keep coming. Okay. They're ultimately creating an urban farming environment for neighbors to pick their own produce. We do it all free of charge. We don't want to take nothing from anyone. We just want to give, we want to educate, and we want to provide. Margie Hackett nice lives across the street. I like it a lot, and it's nice, you know, to see vegetables growing and everything. It makes the whole area really, really nice. She believes the community is reaping the benefits of the garden. I see people get out more and walk around, you know. So it's a, it's a safer neighborhood. Peace Tree Parks teams up with other organizations so none of the food goes to waste. We're going to wash them, bundle them up, and uh, rubber band them, donate them straight to the Detroit Rescue Mission. We feel like that's where they'll make the biggest impact. Andrews plans to continue to grow the organization. Yes, we still got a long way to go, as you can see, but our goal is to turn this into a complete farm farm right here in the city of Detroit. That's our goal. The group is well on its way, already buying more land in the city. Next, we're going to attack the North End, and then we, we also acquire five pieces of land off of Mac on the east side. To provide more access to fresh produce and spread education in Detroit. That's one of our main goals, is just to bridge the gap, encourage people to grow their own food. Andrews believes Peace Tree Parks will spur an organic those, change in the landscape and mindsets of Detroiters for years to come. I'm a true Detroiter, you know, so I'm from here. I'm, I'm true. My son, is he's, he's going to grow up here. So this is not for me. It's for him. It's for his generation, you know, ultimately. I'm Coco McAvoy, Local 4. As I look at that, and I looked at the cultivating, they went into these broken lots and went there. This is Genesis 1 stuff. Going in where there's chaos and brokenness and tilling it and working it, putting good soil in, and planting stuff. That's what you were meant to do as a man. Listen, the women are waiting for us. Some of your children, they're waiting on you to stand up. Future generations are waiting for men to begin subduing. As much as educated as the sisters are, they still want you to lead. As strong as they are, they don't want to be strong by themselves. Sometimes they need us to be strong. And so, gentlemen, let's go on this journey as we recapture the identity that Jesus Christ has given us to live for him and those in our sphere. Lord God, we thank you. And we honor you for your power and your might. Help us to be recommitted, men, for your goodness and for your glory, for your praise, God, that we would find that there are tons of godly men who are putting their hand to the plow and are saying, yes, God. Yes, I want to live for you. Yes, I want to continue to walk with you. And I want to be fruitful in every single area of my life. Maybe you're here today and you've never met Jesus Christ as Savior. This is not merely a call for men. This is a call for anyone. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, 
who suffered and was buried makes himself available to anyone that will confess him as Lord today. If that's you and you say, I know I'm not in a relationship with God, but I want to commit my life to Jesus Christ. Will you hold your hand up in the end? We'd love to talk to you about Jesus. The best decision that you can make is to place your confidence in the one who takes you from spiritually being separated to being deeply spiritually connected.